Please stand if you are able and for the prayer of illumination and then remain standing for the sermon text. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. Our sermon text comes from 2 Kings 2, 1 through 2, and then 9 through 14. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way to, from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet, if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha said, Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? He asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, now for the sermon. <laughs> Hold on. He used to be a teacher, and now you know him as preacher. Ladies and gentlemen, the Reverend Jerry Rabb. Um, Ryan's not old enough because I'm his elder, but, uh, and I'm not old enough to really remember this, but I do have one for you, Ryan, sometime that I'll do where I wear my robe and uh, do Here Comes the Judge. <laughs> and uh, it's pretty, pr I don't know if anyone gets anything out of it, but it's pretty funny. All right, so. It is a time of reunion, getting back together. Several of you probably went to family reunions over the past weekend or Memorial Weekend, or maybe one even coming up for 4th of July. It's our school reunion. And for Jenny and I, it's a reunion with you. This is our actual first anniversary Sunday. Uh, we came a year ago. I, I know for some of you, it seems like it's been seven. I have that dog year impact on people. Uh, Jenny has to smooth that out. But we were just reflecting and reminiscing of, of what is occurred and where God has moved in the course of a year, but I want to try to take something well beyond a year. I want to move to a conversation, a discussion, a, a dialogue around generation to generation. Remember these words from Deuteronomy 7 verse 9, for you know that the Lord your God is God and that he is faithful in keeping his covenant and his steadfast love to those who love him and keep his commandment to the 10,000th generation. We are here not on our own. We are here because God has reached out to us through his son Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and has brought forth a new generation while retaining the previous generation and all that have ever been and will be. Today's text is a reminder of good things, great men, and how God calls it to be handed down to the next generation. Elijah is a person of great influence in the biblical text. He's really kind of one of those superheroes in faith. He didn't have a cape, but he had a cloak. He was faster than a speeding locomotive before locomotives is what I'm saying. There weren't any high buildings to jump or he would have jumped them. Whenever 
the prophets of Baal said you can't do anything. He put water on it and he dug a trench and he called down fire from God and he, switched, he scorched it all up. And then he took the sword to every one of them, one on 400 and whooped them all. That's Elijah, folks. He's hard to follow, isn't he? He's one of those guys that still, even when Christ was on the cross and people said, who is he? He said, wait, 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 he might be Elijah, right? Or maybe one of those other prophets. Wait, maybe he's calling on Elijah to come to his rescue. Elijah is a hero of faith. And Elijah did his part. And Elijah, we don't talk about him in the past because he never died. He was taken to be with the Lord, just like Enoch in the book of Genesis, the only two who had that similar experience. But Elijah was not the be-all or the end-all. Elijah was a man of God. He was and is not God. So what was going to happen? Something had to move forward. Now, a year ago when we walked in this place, we got to do a little preview, okay? So we got to do some investigation before y'all knew we were here. And uh, so we, d we did a little assessment, a little, you know, driving around, looking at town, watching y'all doing your things, you know, without y'all knowing. It. It's great being a spy in the land, but that doesn't last very long, does it? So we can become accustomed to the things that we have. And so when I walk into the sanctuary, I'm, I have to remind myself of how amazing this place really is. Y'all ever feel that way when you come in here? Y'all know another church in town with a dome on it? The courthouse had a dome on it originally. Did you know that? And they're trying to do this renovation, and guess what they can't find? The dome, because it's on First Methodist is what I told them. <laughs> we have a way of erasing history probably, you know. In the middle of the night when no one was watching, <laughs> members of the Methodist Episcopal South Church were here on top of the courthouse chiseling that thing off. Now, I mean, it's an amazing place, isn't it? The stained glass windows with people's names and Sunday schools that predate us, and it's even getting harder and harder all the time to find the story behind them because as generations move on, we sometimes have a tendency to forget where we have come from. But I want you to think for a moment that in 20 years this would be an empty building in one generation. That no one who's here would be here. That we'd all either had been taken up by Lord, kicked the can, or had moved on somewhere else. Whatever the reason. Imagine this place empty. Would it be the same? What about when there used to be curtains here instead of actual barriers to keep the people from the Balcony from stomping too hard during a song and falling off the edge. You know, I mean, y'all remember those stories that they tell about curtains and kids looking underneath them and throwing spit wads down on ball headed people and they don't tell you that story? Yeah, you've heard it before too. And so it's a part of who we are. Laity, generational families, clergy that have come and gone and those who will come again if we remember God's steadfast love is from generation to generation. We have a part in that, just like Elijah and Elisha. So regeneration. A guy by the name of Edwin Friedman wrote a theory of, called Family Systems Theory and applied it to church and synagogue. It's called Generation to Generation. And he said that we do most of the things that we do based on a prior experience that we may not know about. So one of the ones that I've heard, and do y'all know that you can only believe half of what Gary Wayne tells you? Uh, so if this is half truth, it still sounds hilarious to me. Borrowed motor homes and buses packed with kids hanging out the window to go to church camp. Any of y'all remember that other than Gary Wayne? Y'all remember that? Some, no? What happened? 
Had your memories away? Or you're just saying, I'm not as old as Gary Wayne? <laughs> huh? We, we have a heritage. Will we leave a legacy? That's the question of Elijah's to Elisha's. I never want to think of myself as being an Elijah or an Apostle Paul. I always want to think of being the Elisha or the Timothy. But the truth is, with every year, we get a little older and our roles begin to transition and change. Elijah and Elisha. Elijah was not too long for the world in which 2 Kings is written. Most of 1 Kings tells his prophecy and his ministry. Now it's a transition, a succession of authority as the prophet. Elisha was not the only one. In fact, they're at Gilgal and Elijah's saying, hey, we got to go down to Bethel, but it's not going to be a we deal. It's going to be I need to go. The Lord's calling me. You stay here. And here's what Elisha says. Remember this, people, when you're younger. As the Lord lives and as you live, which may not be much longer, old man, right? I'm not leaving your side. There's something to learning from the older generation. Now, in this sense, it was positive, right? It was about how God worked. You can also learn the negative things, and you can say, well, I'm not going to do that, right? Pete and repeat's not always a good thing. But I'm going to tell you that because of this physical, tangible place that we worship in on Sundays, someone believed that God was God. That the Lord, your God, is God. And the, He is faithful in keeping His covenant and His steadfast love to those who love Him and keep His commandments to the 10,000th generation. Well, are we at 9,999th? I don't think so. So how do we go about being part of this? One is going out two by two, Elijah and Elisha. Too many times in our modern dynamics, people want to go it alone. I got this. I can handle this. Luke chapter 10, when Jesus is sending out the 70 or the 72, depending on how you translate the Greek, they go out two by two, never alone. And they watch and they learn from each other. So we didn't read this part of the story about Elijah and Elisha, but Elisha's saying, I'm not going to leave your side. Three times, Elijah would say, Elisha, you're cramping my style. You know why he said that? I know. He is an old man. What are old men? Crotchety. All right? Hard to get along with. I have been an old man since the day I was born. Crotchety and hard to get along. I got this. You, you stay here. God's calling me to something. But three times, Elisha will have none of it. In fact, other prophets will get in on the conversation. They started talking. All small towns talk. Bethel was a small town. They show up in Bethel. Some prophets come up to Elisha. Hey, Elisha, do you know that your master will be taken from you today? Now that tells you that their prophecy was correct. But you know what he says? Speak nothing of it. I already know this. I don't need to hear it. Let me live today with every moment that I have that I might learn something from this generation ahead of me. Moving forward together. Elijah again says there at Bethel, hey, I got to go down to Jericho. They got a good deal down there. I need to go see about it. So you stay here. He says, nope. As sure as the Lord lives, and is the Lord still alive? Can't tell by looking at y'all, but he is, all right? The Lord's still alive. And he says, sure as you live, I will not leave your side. So they go down to Jericho. They get down to Jericho. There's 50 prophets down there, and they're like, hey, Elisha, you know what's going to happen to the old man today? Yeah, I know, but don't say anything about it. I don't have time for that. Pipe down. And Elijah comes up to him again and says, Hey, Elijah, i got to go down to the Jordan today, do some business with God. You stay here. No, nope. as sure as the Lord lives, as sure as you live, I will not leave your side. Being persistent with the older generation tends to lead to a greater good being accomplished. 
older generation, let us be willing to let the younger ones tag along, to learn, to, to have that shared experience. Younger ones, let us be engaging enough to say, you have something that I need to learn. Well, they get down there to the Jordan, and uh, we didn't read this part, but this is a part of a, uh, people call it hazing now, but I'm going to say it's still good. Y'all ever pop anyone with a towel? I was so proud of my oldest son. He's four years younger, older than the youngest one. The youngest one, when we get him out of the bathtub, y'all can tell him this when you see him sometime in church when he comes by. He'll love this. He had a duck head towel that was like a little robe. And uh, when he was little, he was kind of built like his dad, well-rounded. And uh, he'd, when he was a little bit, he'd put that duck towel on him, and we'd wrap him up, and he'd run around the house, and it was great. Well, after about a couple of months, he got too well-rounded for that thing to tie, and he'd just go streaking through the house, and he'd call himself Super Naked Boy. And he's he real proud of himself. We thought, this is going to be awkward when people come over when he's 16, got a duck towel on his head, you know. So his mother was adamant in praying, Lord, help give my son some sense of uh, humility and also at the same time some shame. So she prayed shame into his life so he'd get a fig leaf at least. But um, one time he was picking on his brother when he was getting out of the shower, older brother. And so older brother just took his duck towel off, which made little brother do what? Cry. And he rolled it up and he went, I'll give you something to cry about. And pow, popped him one. That was the sign of good fatherhood as far as I was concerned. <laughs> Popping a towel. Elijah takes his cloak, pops the Jordan River, and it divides left to the right. Y'all have ever heard any Bible stories where the river divides or the sea divides? It's a sign of God's activity so that he and Elisha could go across on dry ground. And as they're going over, Elijah looks down and says, mm, what can I do for you? What's, what's this last, give me your last request. And Elisha, if you read it literally, rather than saying give me a double portion of your spirit, it would say, let your life be repeated in mine. What an honor, right? To know that someone saw you as that godly that they'd say, I want the life that you have because it's a holy one. It's a righteous one. And Elijah rightfully so says, I can't give you that. But I'll tell you something. If you see me when I'm taken up, may it be so. And so all of a sudden there comes a wind. Y'all know about these things out here, right? But then there's these chariots and these horses that are on fire and they separate Elijah from Elisha. And when you look at renderings of artwork, it's amazing how they show it. It looks more like Elijah's looking down and Elisha's looking up. And, and there's a mantle being passed. See, we, we, we have a tendency to hand things down that end up over the mantle, don't we? I've got an old Winchester that was my dad's, and y'all got to build me a fireplace so I have a mantle. I got it in an office so I could hang it up there. And um, believe it or not, I don't have any 3840 Winchester ammunition at the house with black powder in it because they quit making that when my dad was before he was born. But it's still one of those heirloom type things, right? That if, if a bear comes to my house, I'm supposed to grab that off the fireplace and and then I'm ready to go. But I've got no ammunition. And you know how many bears are breaking into our houses down here, right? <laughs> so I feel really ill-prepared that I should have said, Dad, before you're taken up, Give me some 3840 ammunition for the thing that you're going to hand down. Sometimes we think we're preparing the next generation when we don't even know what to give them and they don't know how to ask. Elisha knew what to ask for. Elijah just basically said, that's going to be in God's hands. But all of his life, he'd been living that example. And of course, Elisha's mantle falls to the ground, and there's Elisha. And Elisha does what we should all do, pick it up. One of the greatest struggles in the church is generational handoffs. 
How do you do that? Well, sometimes we're holding on to it so tight. I always laugh about what we'll hold on to in a church building. I won't make any of yours personal, okay, because that hurts too bad, right? We all do it. There's something that we're really proud of. Uh, it could be the pew you're sitting in right now, like you're clutching it right now. You ain't taking my pew. I'm not asking for your pew or your choir chair, although I did take those and help put them in a truck and got new covering on them. And y'all didn't even know, right? See how protective y'all are over your stuff? But we'll hang on to stuff. We want to keep it. When at the end of the day, we're always saying, but we need someone else to do it, right? How many times have we been caught when we get a certain stage of life saying, those youngsters, they won't take over. Now, youngsters, you shouldn't get to take over everything. If you're saying, I'm not a youngster, then you don't listen to this part. That means you're hanging on to something already. But we don't give you the church van keys unless you meet the requirements for the insurance. And then when you get too old, we don't give you the van keys because you don't meet the church insurance requirement, but you take them anyways, right? So learn that. Sometimes you just got to pick it up. And Elisha picked up the mantle, and he went back to the river, and he asked a question that people are like, well, what kind of faith did he have? He's cried out, Father, Father, oh, the chariots and horses of Israel. Because it's pretty, you know, it was a pretty amazing day that day, right? To see him taken up in a chariot of fire. But when he goes over to the river, he says, Where is the God of Israel and the God of Elijah? Where are you? And he takes the towel, rolls it up, pops it, and he goes across. And as soon as he goes across, these other 50 prophets who are watching, they're like, ooh, that was pretty cool, right? But they go right back to the old ways. They beg him, they pester him. They're like, Elisha, Elisha, maybe this whirlwind, this chariot of fire, took Elijah up on another mountain, because Elijah liked to hang out on mountains. All old Bible people like to go to the mountains. Do you old people like to go to the mountains? It's something about it. When you get old, you're like, we don't want to go to the beach anymore. We want to go to the mountains. First sign of, you're becoming an Elijah. All right? Elisha, he's like, what are you talking about? But he finally gives in to him and says, yeah, go looking. And they go out and they look for him. Not one day, not two days, but how many days is everything in the church other than creation? Four, well, it is true, about 40. That's a good one, too. But three days, because these youngsters are lazy, and the, and the new prophets are, Okay? So they look for him for three days, and they finally come back and say, we can't find him. He's like, I told you so. That's how you know Elisha was younger, right? Told you so. He's moving into his role. Moving into our roles. This last week, um, at a couple of meetings, and a couple of the um, elder statesmen and saints of our community, I asked them if they were going to their reunion group, and here is what they said. Nope, they'll just stick me at the old person's table. You, you feel like that sometimes yet? And uh, they said they'll stick me with like 10 classes because everybody else isn't with us anymore. They've been taken up, that type thing. And, and it's a tendency. It will happen if you live long enough. But there's an Altus school this very day, is there not? How long has Altus been a school? Do y'all know? No one knows? Before your time? 1891 is what you think? That's when we kind of became a township, right? A region. So let's just presume it was 1891. In 1891, do you think they could have envisioned that people would be coming back from all around the world to celebrate being a bulldog? I bet you they weren't called the bulldogs then because they probably hadn't been invented yet wasn't a recognized breed of the AKC or whatever. <laughs> Things happen over time, and usually if we set the standard, that becomes better. We're here in this place because our forefathers and foremothers said, I believe that God is God, and I know that He is faithful in His steadfast love and keeping His covenant, and I'm going to do my best to love him and keep his commandments. And that's going to go to 10,000 generations. 
I'm glad I get to be somewhere in the midst of that. The question becomes for me, as I pointed out to the kids in Wiggle Time, folks, there's not many who are willing to take over. Well, I shouldn't say take over. That sounds like a hostile takeover. It is sometimes, right? That want to answer their call to ministry for the vocation. Because the church, universal, is struggling with affirming that. I believe we are different and unique. When we came in here a year ago, there was about half this many right here in this sanctuary. Did you know that? About half as many. And I asked for someone else to do the count since I can't see all of you. All right, so that's not a made-up preacher number. That's a made-up usher number. <laughs> not mine. But the ushers can't make up the number that comes in the plates. I don't know why they can't change that. They need to get their mantles off and start popping, right? We are in a situation to where if someone doesn't pick up the mantle of the prophets that go before them and the preachers that go before them and the teachers, we're going to lose the next generation. It's the bottom line. It's always been like that. It's one generation to the other. Not God's faithfulness, but our faithfulness towards God. So I want to encourage you to take a look at where you're at in the generations. Now, if you can say you're part of the greatest generation that Walter Cronkite said, Methuselah, thank you for being here, right? Because <laughs> it's really changed already for the most part to that group that was uh, singing that talking about my generation, you know, where they stuttered in the song, talk, talk, talking about my generation. That's my mother and father's generation. So my generation, we just took your songs and put a bad downbeat to them and called them ours, and now they... Y'all don't even have music now, do you? At the park, they brought in someone. I'm like, I don't know him. I don't care. It's not Hank Williams Jr., so who cares, right? So the, uh, the thing about it is we have to do our part to look out for the next. I'm wanting, hoping, and praying that you'll take someone under wing that's younger than you in the faith or in age. And that you'll make this our goal for next year. That we will raise up somebody from this congregation who will answer the call of vo Christian vocation. I don't know what that looks like to them. They don't know what that looks like to them. But you may know more of what that looks like in helping them. The number one purpose of a staff parish relations committee is not to hire employees or fire employees or give pay raises or take away monies or whatever we might make it. It's to identify persons who will be called into ministry. And you're like going, shoo, I'm glad I'm not on the staff parish relations committee. Yeah, you're, you're part of the parish and we have a staff and we're all in this relationship together. We need it as a local church and as an area ministry. We need to find those who are ready to pick up the mantle. And if you're not answering the call to vocational ministry, may you know that all of us are ministers in whatever our vocation. So just as we would encourage our youth to go on to trainings and help guide them, may we do so with our own families and our own friends. We came from a community to where any given weekend, half of my parish could be in Dallas, Texas, Oklahoma City, El Paso, Texas, following a baseball, a golf ball, a ballet, a gymnastics event, even Boy Scouts. They hurt my feelings, and I'm a Boy Scouter. It didn't matter what the thing was, half of them were gone, and it was okay. When I hear parishioners saying that they're struggling with trying to keep their families together on Sunday morning, I want you to know that we're all in this together. We should struggle. We should stand firm as a community and as a church to say that Sunday is reserved for worshiping the Lord because those other things will creep in. And so if you're old enough to remember when that was considered a no-no, we need your help. Because right now, the younger generation is saying, I want to serve the Lord, 
but my friends are all doing this. And you guys know this from these reunion groups. Has anyone ever told a lie about y'all at a reunion group? You know, you get together and you're like, do you remember when you did that? And you're like, no, I don't remember that. No, I, they, and they got like, I'm so glad they didn't have cell phones when I was growing up because then they'd have pictures. Now I've got plausible deniability. I'm like, it's your word against mine and no one believes you, right? So that's what happens over time. Things become a memory and sometimes we forget those memories. The next generation is struggling to remember what it was like to have this place full. What it was like to have kids go to church camp, youth and children. To forget what it was like to have a wedding in a sanctuary. When's the last time y'all went to a sanctuary wedding? Yeah, been quite a while, huh? To have funerals in the sanctuary. Take a look with me and just look up here a little bit. Now, I don't know if heaven's really up there because Revelation says that the kingdom of heaven came back to earth. But when I look up through that dome, I see like a portal and access to heaven. And when I see that cross, I know that that's the way to get there. When I hear a piano and an organ played and a choir singing, I'm reminded of the company of heaven. When I see the desire to put new pew cushions so that parishioners can sleep better during sermons, <laughs> I'm reminded that we have a future. You know what I'm saying? Don't ever forget it. If you're an Elijah, get you an Elisha. If you're an Elisha, go find you an Elijah and hang on. When they're like, get away from me, kid. Nope, the Lord still lives. And as you live, I'm not leading your side. And when that time comes, and you see that mantle, will you pick it up? That's all that God is asking. We don't have to have any more of the answers. For his steadfast love is from generation to generation. Let's give praise to God. Lord, you're on the throne. You're in... You've been given authority to over all of this. The earth is your footstool. And yet you still give us stewardship. Whoo, Jesus, sometimes I think about when you must say about me, oh my gosh, what is Jerry up to right now? But Lord, you gave me Elijah's. I've hung on to them. You had to take them. You give me other Elijah's. I hang on to them. You had to take them. They're yours. Now, as I transition more to becoming an Elijah, may I be more adamant in identifying the Elishas. Thank you, Lord, for the spirit of Elijah being twofold because it was the spirit of God. Thank you now that since Pentecost Sunday, the spirit of the Lord has been given to all Christian believers, and they all have a gift and a purpose in this body. Let us, Lord, never forget those who have come before us. As we read names on stained glass windows, or we go through a hall and we see a class that was once a nursery and now it's a Sunday school class, or we go to a new building where there was a new vision and new nurseries, so many nurseries that we would have to have a thousand kids in this church. Lord, I pray for that. I pray for us to all pull out our hair because of a thousand kids in this church and everybody's saying what are we going to do with them i don't know they're gods let's figure it out lord i pray for all those men and women young boys and girls that you placed a call upon their lives help us to never forget that help us to keep the sabbath holy and to remember it lord thank you for putting us in this place where others have gone before we pray your blessing upon all the churches that they would no longer converse and talk about we haven't recovered since the pandemic, but they begin to say, we don't have enough room. We need more space. We need larger places for the Lord to be worshipped. Lord, thank you for your steadfast love from generation to generation. To God be the glory now and forever. In the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.